million dreams for the world we're gonna make. Today we're kicking off the series with a sermon entitled, A Million Dreams. This is a song from the film. It's the second song in the film, and it's one that has really gotten into my spirit. In fact, I, when, I, when I listen to the song and I sing the song, I actually get a little bit choked up about what it says. This song is sung by a young P.T. Barnum to a girl named Charity who he is in love with. And then later, when he is an adult, they sing it together to each other as she becomes his wife. Barnum in the film is a man that comes from meager means. He's the son of a tailor. He doesn't have wealth. He doesn't have riches. He doesn't have much, to be honest. But Charity comes from a very wealthy family, and she actually is pretty much disowned by that family when she chooses to marry Barnum. The song that they sing talks about the life that they someday want to have together, how things could be in the future. And one of my favorite lines in the song says, we can live in a world that we design. As we jump into our story from scripture today, I want you to think about that. We can live in a world that we design. And I want you to ask yourself the question, if you could change the world, what would it look like? In 1 Samuel 17, we find the story of the nation of Israel preparing to go to battle with the Philistines. It's a story that pretty much everyone, even those who were not raised in church, are familiar with. It's a story about a young man who wasn't afraid to change his world. Now, for the sake of time today, we're not going to read the entire story, but rather I will pull individual scriptures out throughout, and each time I do, they will be in the God's Word translation. But let me set the stage for you. There's a man named Saul who's king of Israel. Saul is a, a handsome man. He is a, he's a large man. They said that he actually stood head and shoulders above the entire nation of Israel. Saul is king, but he has sinned and has angered God. And the nation of Israel is about to have to pay the price for that. The Philistine army has come to the valley of Elah and is challenging the Israelite army. And the Philistines have one soldier in particular who is quite intimidating. His name is Goliath. Goliath is what most people would call a giant. Scholars believe that he is somewhere between nine and ten feet tall. This is something that for me is difficult to grasp because we don't see people that tall. We actually, I was thinking about it, and I was going to call somebody up to, to help me do an illustration to, to help me show how large this man was because we actually have some pretty tall men in our church. But then I realized that even the tall men in our church would be towered over by Goliath. Goliath, if he's nine to 10 feet tall, would stand roughly three to four feet taller than I am. Which basically means if he was wearing this hat, it would be right there. That's a big dude. And even if I called Jeff and Adam and Seth and John up here to be my bodyguards, and to show you how big those guys are and how safe I would feel when they're around. If a guy that big walked in, that would be pretty scary. Goliath was a giant. And everyone in Israel's army was scared of him. And he knew it. So here's what he did. Every day, Goliath would come out from the Philistine battle lines, he would walk between the Philistines and the Israelites. And he would yell across to the Israelites and he would mock them and he would make fun of them and he would say, just send me one man, your best warrior. And if he can beat me, then we will all become your slaves. But if I kill him, 
You must serve us. How humiliating that must have been. The scripture tells us that this went on for 40 days. Every day, Goliath would come out, walk in front of the Philistine battle line, and mock the Israelites and challenge them. But then one day, a shepherd boy named David happened to be delivering some food to his brothers who were in the army. And this little shepherd boy was there when Goliath came out and puffed out his chest and made his challenge. And when this happened, David did the first thing that we must do if we're going to change the world. Now, you may have noticed when you came in, there are papers lying on the seats. There's one about every other seat. I've I've challenged you guys several times to take notes because God loves people who take notes. Today I wanted to make it super easy for you to take notes. I gave you a fill-in-the-blank sheet where all you have to do is write six words. The first one of those words is determined because the first thing that David did and the first thing that we must do if we're going to change the world is David determined there was a problem. In 1 Samuel 17, 26, it says that David said, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should challenge the army of the living God? In other words, David says, Who is this guy and what is he doing? Who does he think he is and what does he think he's doing? David saw that there was a problem. He knew that things shouldn't be this way. And when David saw this problem, it really got under his skin. In fact, I believe that if David had chosen to go back to the field, back to the sheep to care for his flock, that he probably would have been kept up at night thinking about the injustice that was being done by this Philistine. And just like David, if we are to change the world, we must first determine that there's a problem. And we must be so committed to this determination that it keeps us up at night. You see, the problem that exists in most people today is that we've become too used to the problems around us. We are too comfortable with them. We are the proverbial frog in the pot. How do you boil a frog? Slowly. You see, the story, as I have been told, is that if you take a frog and you throw it into a pot of boiling water, that either by a conscious decision that it makes or by a bodily reaction, it will immediately jump out of the pot. In fact, I've been told that the same thing happens with frog legs if you throw them in a frying pan, that the, that the muscles will, will jerk and they will bounce out of the pot. But if you place that same frog in a bowl of room temperature water and slowly turn up the heat, that the frog will slowly adjust to the new temperatures until he's boiled alive. Yeah, I don't eat frogs. But unfortunately, we are like the frog in the pot. This is why we can live in northwest Arkansas, which is one of the most food insecure areas in the country. It is one of the areas of the country with the most hunger, and we can live in this area and do nothing about it. But then we can go on a missions trip to inner city St. Louis or the Appalachian Mountains or the country of Honduras and see hungry people there and be moved to action. In our new surroundings, we see the need, but in our current surroundings... We're too used to it. We can live in an area like northwest Arkansas that has nearly 3,000 homeless people, 54% of whom are children, and we can do nothing. But we will give hundreds or thousands of dollars to build a home for one family that doesn't have one in another country. Now, don't get me wrong, we definitely need to do something about poverty and homelessness and tragedies worldwide. 
but we also have to do something about what's going on in our own backyard. You see, we have to see the hunger and the homelessness and the divorce rate and the fatherlessness and the poverty and the overcrowding in our foster care system and most importantly, the lack of Jesus in people's lives as a problem. And then we have to do the second thing that David did. We have to resolve to fix it. You see, David wasn't the only person who saw the problem that was going on. David wasn't, surely couldn't have been the only person who saw what Goliath was doing and said, that's not right. But no one else, at least no one that is talked about in the Bible, did anything to fix it. The Bible says that when all the men of Israel saw Goliath, they fled from him because they were terrified. But David didn't do this. David said, huh, uh, that's not going to happen on my watch. He went to King Saul, and in verse 32, we read that David told Saul, no one should be discouraged because of this. I will go and fight this Philistine. He said, hey, tell everyone not to worry. It's okay. I'll go fight him. David said, enough is enough. And even when no one else was willing or able to do anything about it, he did. Church, we've got to do the same thing. If we're going to change the world, we've got to resolve to fix the problem. Let me tell you something. I like you guys. I like you a lot, most of you. And I really enjoy coming together every week and worshiping God together, and hearing from the word together. I love the fact that, that all us guys are going to go to Golden Corral as soon as this 21-day fast is over, and we're going to make total pigs of ourselves. I love that we're going to come together this Thursday night for a Pinewood Derby with our boys. I love all that. But that's not why Center Point Church exists. You see, before God ever told Christina and I that we were going to come to Lowell, he told us that we were going to pastor a church that was focused on outreach. That we were going to pastor a church that was focused on making the world a better place to live. In fact, when he told us that we were coming to Lowell, I was like, are you sure? Because he'd already told us what we were going to do. And in, in my simple mind, I couldn't figure out how that worked in Lowell. Until he began to open my eyes. The reason we exist is to make a difference. We have determined that there is a problem, several of them in fact. And we have resolved to fix them or to die trying. There are people in this room who became a part of our launch team, some of them almost a year before we ever even had a church. And the reason they decided to be a part of what's going on here is because they heard me get up after I fed them pizza, they heard me get up and say, we're going to change the world and make it a better place to live. And I told them in those meetings, I have no idea how, but it's going to happen. Now I have a little bit better idea how, but still not much of one. But just like David did, we are going to face people who don't believe our vision is possible. People who don't believe that it's possible to change the world by doing small things to make it better. And when we encounter those people, we have to do the same thing that David did. We must evade the naysayers. I bet you didn't think I could come up with an E word for that, did you? I'll admit it was difficult. I had to rack my brain for quite some time, but I persevered and I won. Kids, stay in school. When David decided that he was going to do something, he faced opposition at every turn. We read that his brother Eliab chastised him. He got angry and he said, what are you even doing here? And with whom have you left those few sheep that you were in charge of? And then when David met with Saul and said, I'm going to fight this Philistine, Saul said, 
you can't fight this Philistine. You're just a boy. And he's been a warrior since he was your age. Everyone who had convinced themselves that it was impossible to change the world decided to convince David of the same thing. But David evaded their attempts and kept the course. And guys, let me tell you, as crazy as it sounds, we will encounter people just like Eliab and just like Saul. In fact, we already have. We have, we have had people tell us that we can't make a difference. We've had people tell us that you can't make things better by handing out water bottles or giving blankets to homeless people. We've had people tell us that the problems are too big and you are too small. That's why I love this song, A Million Dreams, and that's why it makes me cry when I listen to it. Because listen to what the song says. It says, they can say, they can say, it all sounds crazy. They can say, they can say, we've lost our minds. But I don't care. I don't care if they call us crazy. We can live in a world that we design. Church, do you believe that? Do you believe that no matter how crazy it seems and no matter how many people tell us that it can't be done, that we can imagine the world as it should be and then take steps towards making that world a reality. I believe that. And let me encourage you with this thought. Everyone who was trying to convince David that what he knew he had to do was impossible was doing nothing. I have a couple of friends who own two houses this couple owns two homes, and, and they live in one, and they rent out the other. And the way they were able to do that is they worked really hard to, to get really close to paying their first home off that they bought when they got married. And then when it was almost paid off, instead of selling it and upgrading to a new home, they made the decision to keep their home, rent it out, and take out a mortgage on a new home. I remember Mike telling me that it was really scary to make that move. And he told me that every single person who he told they were going to do this tried to talk him out of it. Every single person said, that's a terrible idea. You're going to lose money. They're going to tear up your house. You're going to hate being a landlord. And then he realized that every single person who was telling them that had never done it. And that's the same situation we're going to face is that people who have never done what we know God's telling us to do are going to tell us that it's impossible. But we're not going to do it alone. In fact, doing so probably would be impossible. So when we encounter people that try to discourage us, we have to do the same thing that David did when Saul tried to discourage him. We have to acknowledge our source. David said, listen, Saul, you don't understand. I'm a shepherd, and, and when I'm in the fields, one time a lion came and, and took one of my sheep in its mouth and tried to get away with it, and I chased that lion down, grabbed it by the mane, struck it, and killed it. Later, I did the same thing to a bear. And then he says this in verse 37. The Lord who saved me from the lion and the bear will save me from this Philistine. David knew where his help came from. David knew that in his own strength, he probably wasn't strong enough to do what God was telling him to do. He wasn't strong enough to accomplish this task. But he knew that with God, nothing is impossible. And I know that too. I know that we are starting a church in the Bible Belt in a town of 12,000 people. In an area where most people who care at all about going to church are already in a church somewhere. 
I know that we started with an average of about 42 people on a Sunday morning, and now on most days we'll have somewhere between 55 and 60. And I know that to be healthy and financially stable for the long term, that we need to double that number. I know that the task that has been set before us is huge. And that we're going to need lots and lots of volunteers working together towards the vision. But I also know where our help comes from. I know that I didn't choose to do what we're doing here, but that God chose us and called us all together. And I know that Ephesians 2.10 in the New International Version says, we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Isn't that awesome? We were created to do good works that God prepared in advance for us to do. I don't know about you, but I can live with that. I can live with an impossible task if I know that God's the one that's empowering me to do it and telling me to do it and that he's already worked it out before I even knew about it. David determined there was a problem. He resolved to fix it. He evaded the naysayers. He acknowledged his source. And then when it was time for words to stop and actions to start, David moved strategically. You see, when David finally convinced Saul to let him go fight the Philistine, Saul, who was this large man that, that was head and shoulders above all of Israel, took all of his armor and put it on little David. This armor was so heavy that David couldn't even move. It was nice armor. It was armor that a soldier would love to fight in. But it was too big for David, and it wasn't what he had trained in. So he took off the armor, and in verse 40 it says, he took his stick with him, picked out five smooth stones from the riverbed, and put them in his shepherd's bag. With a sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Now, some people would say, that doesn't sound strategic. That sounds stupid. But let me explain something to you. Let me, let me clarify and, and fix a common misconception about this story. Because I think what sometimes happens is we, in our modern-day minds, we picture this little kid with a slingshot that he bought at Walmart walking up to this huge giant and, and closing his eyes and pulling back on the sling and then letting go and just hoping that he hits the giant. That God somehow directs the stone into the giant. Guys, that's not what happened. I've even seen cartoons for kids that, that, that make it that, like, like, I saw this one cartoon one time. The stone had eyes and a mouth, and, and, and when he got shot out of the sling, he, he was off course, and he was like, uh, you know, leaning over to make sure he hit Goliath. But David's sling was a weapon of war. And David was well-trained and well-equipped to use that weapon. David's decision wasn't foolish. It was strategic. Because the thing is, if David had taken Saul's armor, that really nice armor, and he had marched out to fight that giant in hand-to-hand -hand combat, this is not a story we would be telling in church today. In fact, Goliath probably wouldn't have been too far off when he said, come here, boy. When I'm done with you, I will feed your body to the birds and the wild animals. David was strategic. He fought Goliath from a distance, and he fought him with a weapon he knew how to use. And if we're going to change the world, we too must move strategically. See, guys, I don't know about you, but when I hear a sermon like this, I get so pumped up. Like, like I just want to charge hell with a squirt gun. 
I just want to go in and just, just squirt the devil right in the face and put out the fire and grab everybody who he's got trapped there and, and bring them out. I want to go out today and I want to pick up every piece of trash in northwest Arkansas and then I want to go buy groceries for every single person who's hungry, even the ones that have food at home. I just want to feed them. And then I want to go build a house for every homeless person in northwest Arkansas and then I want to go find a forever home for all the kids in the foster system. You get the picture, right? Like, like that's how this makes me feel. And hopefully it makes some of you feel that way because if not, you're probably dead. That wasn't in the notes. But the fact is, if we take on too much at one time, we're going to get tired and we're going to fail. We have to be strategic and we have to pick our battles. So we're going to start small like we did in December, packaging toys and handing them out to underprivileged kids as part of the great gift exchange. That was so much fun. I loved it. We're going to serve as a drop point for Blankets and coats and scarves and gloves for the homeless shelter. And then we're going to go buy some ourselves and we're going to take them down and try to help the people keep warm a little bit. We're going to go on the fifth Saturday, on the, on the four months that have a fifth Saturday, we're going to go with Bella Vista Assembly and we're going to go down to Genesis Church and feed the homeless people. We're going to go to Tucker Elementary and we're going to start a mentorship program where, where we all give 30 minutes to an hour of our week. And we go in and we, we play with the kids at recess or we read them a story or we, we do something to show these kids that somebody cares about them. We're going to pick a few things that we know we can do. And then as we go, we're going to add more things that we know that we can do with God's help. And one little thing after another little thing after another little thing will add up to really big things. We will move strategically to get the most impact from our efforts, just like David did. And the last thing that David did as it pertains to our story is he started what he finished. Verse 51 says, David ran and stood over the Philistine. He took Goliath's sword and pulled it out of its sheath and made certain that the Philistine was dead by cutting off his head. David completed the job. He made sure it was done. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. I see the confused looks on your faces. You're saying, don't you mean he finished what he started? Well, I do, sort of. But see, here's the thing. If I told you that David finished what he started, then the last letter of our acronym would be F. And the word would be DREMF. And I don't even think that's a word. But I know that dreams is a word. That's the word we're talking about today is dreams. But more than just trying to make an acronym work, which as you can see, I'm really good at, there's something more that I want to convey here. You see, David did make sure that the job was done. He cut the giant's head off to make sure he was dead. But he never could have finished the job if he hadn't started it. David had to start what he would soon finish. He had to get moving and so do we. For us to change the world, we can't just dream about it. We can't just talk about it. We can't just say we're going to do it. We have to move on those dreams. I love the song that we're using to kick off this series. I love how it reminds me what God has called us to do. The chorus says this. Every night I lie in bed. The brightest colors fill my head. A million dreams are keeping me awake. I think of what the world could be. A vision of the one I see. 
a million dreams is all it's going to take. A million dreams for the world we're going to make. Guys, here's my prayer for us today. I pray that God begins to stir up dreams within you of how you can make the world a better place. And I pray that you will get so excited about those dreams as he puts them in your heart that you won't be able to sleep at night. I pray that you will never let those dreams slip away, that you'll never let anybody convince you that it's impossible, that you'll never not let life get too busy. See, I started today by asking you if you could change the world, what would it look like? Now as we finish, I challenge you, make that happen. Be a difference maker. Change the world. Follow your dreams that God gives you. And I'm excited about doing that with you. So here's how I'd like us to close today. There's a movie from my teenage years. It's probably not appropriate. It's called Jerry Maguire. And in this movie called Jerry Maguire, there's a sports agent that gets fired and and he decides in a, in a moment of uh, not clear-headed passion to go start his own firm. And he, he, he kind of freaks out in front of all of his coworkers and, and he goes over to their fish tank and he like scoops a fish out and puts it in a plastic bag and he says, I'm going to do it and, and this fish is going with me. And he says, who else is going with me? And everybody just kind of sits and stares at him like you guys are doing to me right now. here's how we're going to finish. I want to ask you who's going with me. And if you're willing to go on this journey, if you're willing to chase these dreams, if you're willing to make the world a better place, then I just want you to stand to your feet and say, I'm going with you. Now let's pray that God will help us do what we have committed to do. Can we do that today? Father God, thank you so much. Lord, thank you for the call. Thank you for bringing us here to this place and this time. Thank you for putting a dream in our hearts, God. Lord, I know there are people here who, who have never even heard our background, never heard our story. They don't even know about the dream, the, the actual physical dream that you gave me. But God, I thank you for that dream. I thank you for leading me here. Lord, I thank you for the people that you have begun to surround us with. People with a heart and a vision to see your work done. Lord, I pray that as we determine that there are problems and resolve to fix them and evade the naysayers and we acknowledge you as our source and we begin to move strategically, that you will help us to start what we will finish and that you will help us to be successful. Lord, give us dreams of the world that you want to make. 